Okay, we're live now. So what our class does is we are going through the Bible chronologically. We're going as far as we go each week. No, no set um, amount to um, be prepared for. We're going as slow as we go. Um, and we're in Exodus. So we cool. and we're doing chronologically. So we've done Genesis and Job was in the middle of Genesis. So Arthur's book. This is exciting. So thank you, Janice and Wanda. Last week I had COVID. Oh. So I was home. And Wanda and Janice filled in for me and I appreciate their help. So um, and we are going to pick up in Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. And what we do is we go around the room and read rather than wait for someone to call on someone to read. So we are going to start with you, Becca, for okay. just verse 18. Okay. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. So we left off. Moses was at the burning bush. The burning bush event is over. The fire has faded and the voice of God was silent again. Now it's time to obey and do what God told him to do. How many of us have had a burning bush experience and then afterward it's over and we don't do anything with it. Moses doesn't have that option. He has things he has to do. And when we have a burning bush experience, it shouldn't be a short thing. It should be make a life, lifelong change. Moses' life is certainly changing. He has no idea what he's in for. Um, any way he could have imagined the plagues, parting the Red Sea, those stubborn, stubborn Hebrews. He might not have done it if he knew how stubborn they were, but uh, even farther. Good morning. Good morning. Do you think he could imagine that in the far future he would be on a hill with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? That's all in his future. And if you imagine some of it, he would be excited. Some of it, not so much. Um, so even though God told him what to do, he still honored his father-in-law. It was a culture of honor. So he honored his father-in-law by going and asking his permission to go. Notice all the information. He doesn't tell him, though. He's just going back to visit his brothers. But he's, Moses knows he's going to do a whole lot more, but he doesn't tell Jethro all that stuff. Um, verses 19 through 23. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Okay, so Pharaoh is dead, the one that was trying to kill him. There's a new Pharaoh, and it was a common practice. Good morning, Kate. It was a common practice in the ancient world when a new government came into effect that they pardoned everyone from the previous government. Now God really lets him know what's going to happen, and it's not going to be an easy road. Doesn't tell him till now. Um, we already know Moses is anxious about this whole thing and now he's got to be even more anxious he's not going to just march in and say let him go and, Mo and Pharaoh's going to say okay it's not going to happen 
But even though he had his doubts, the most important thing is he went. It can be scary to go do what God tells us to do, but we need to keep doing it, whatever it is. Notice verse 20. Remember last week we said that was a stick, just a stick. Nothing magical about the stick. What's it called now? Yeah. Um, Staff of God. It's still a stick. But God is going to use this common stick. Notice who hardens Pharaoh's heart. Or heart, yeah. It's after the Pharaoh hardened his heart several times. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> when it says God hardened his heart, God didn't make him do anything he didn't want to do. It was his heart was already there. Um, Pharaoh never said, "Oh, I want to do what is good, and I want to be nice to these Hebrews, and I want to bless them." He never said that. <laughs> um, and God says, "I'm going to I'm going to take what is in his heart and use it." Um, he allowed Pharaoh's heart to do what Pharaoh wanted to do. God gave Pharaoh over to his sin. Now in their culture, in the Hebrew culture, um, God was the source of everything to them. The cause. He made everything happen. So they, they didn't see anything in God hardening Pharaoh's heart. They believed God caused his heart to be hardened. But because of Pharaoh's hardened heart, he sinned. And God does not cause sin. But he will allow someone to sin. But it's what is in that person's heart. Um, so Egyptians had a belief that when a person died, his heart was weighed in a hall of judgment. If the heart was heavy with sin, that person was judged. They would put a stone beetle scarab, if you've ever seen the movie Mo, um, Mummy or anything, all those bugs. They'd place that on the heart of the deceased person to suppress his natural tendency to confess sin. And because if he confessed sin, he would be subject to judgment. The Egyptians had really strange ideas. <laughs> um, so by putting this scarab stone on them it would suppress their their confession and they would be saved uh, they get it all backwards <laughs> so pharaoh he considered himself the only living son of the gods now he's going to hear about a whole other god that is going to talk about people as his children and a whole nation and that's going to be really confusing for pharaoh because he thinks he's the only living son of a god and god moses is going to come in and say god says these are my children um so moses is to go warn pharaoh that he needs to let his firstborn the people of Israel go, or he is going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn. And here, when he's talking about Pharaoh's firstborn, he's talking not just about one son, he's talking about the nation's firstborn. Um, so Pharaoh can't say he wasn't warned. He was warned early on. Okay, you're just in time, verse 24 through 26? What chapter? Uh, four. To catch up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you want, we can go to Pamela. It came, and it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Sephora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go 
Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So this is kind of a mysterious event to throw in the middle of all this. Um, but it seems God is confronting Moses in the strongest way possible um, because Moses hadn't circumcised his son. It doesn't say which son. He has two sons. Um, and I saw commentaries that were saying it was the one son and others that said it was the other son. We don't see anything that says which son, so who knows. Um, there's a lot about this we don't know. We aren't given all the details. We don't know how old Moses' sons are. Some think that they were between 30 and 40 years old. So it's not like it, it was a, he lapsed a few days in circumcising. We don't know why Moses hadn't circumcised his son. Um, maybe Zipporah objected to it, thought it was um, barbaric and wouldn't allow it. We don't know. Um, and if, if it's because Zipporah influenced him, that could be one reason God's really mad, because he let his wife influence him away from the covenant. But we don't know. So, but of course, the rabbinical midrash, which is, yeah, the, Jew, the rabbis had their own interpretations. They say that an angel of the Lord took the form of a serpent and tried to swallow Moses. <laughs> but when he came to Moses, um, when he came to the part of body, the body that Moses had circumcised on himself, he couldn't completely devour him. And Zipporah figured out what the problem was, was and circumcised her son. But not scriptural. Nothing there. Um, it could be that God disabled Moses so Zipporah had to do the circumcision. Um, why is she so bitter? Um, maybe, maybe all of this is hitting her. She has never lived outside of Midian. And now she's a minister's wife. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a whole change in lifestyle. You're expected mm -hmm. to live a certain way and be available to God. And maybe she's just not ready. Um, so she takes a flint. And a flint is made from stone. At that time, they had regular knives, um, but they weren't very sharp. They, it seems that they continued to use flint for circumcision for quite a while after that because they were sharper than the, than the metal knives. Um, Egyptians, when they um, <coughs> embalmed people, they used these uh, stone, stone knives too because they, they were sharper. Okay, we don't know, but it seems like at this point, Moses sends Zipporah and the boys home, back to Midian, um, back to dad. We don't hear about her and the boys again until chapter 18. So this seems like the sensible place for him to have sent her home. We don't know though. Okay, verse 27 through 31. Now the Lord had said to Aaron, Go out into the wilderness to meet Moses. So Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God, and he embraced him. Moses then told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say. And he told him about the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to, to perform. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses. And Moses performed the miraculous sign as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Okay, so while God had been working on Moses, he, he already knew what Moses was going to say. God knows everything. So he had already been working on Aaron, hundreds of miles away. So God told him, go to the wilderness. So Aaron went, went to the wilderness. Do we see anything about where in the wilderness? 
We just go to the wilderness. Um, Aaron's about 83 at this point. Kind of old to go wandering in the wilderness. Um, and he and Moses hadn't seen each other for 40 years. But Aaron goes to the exact right spot. And he and Moses meet up. Must have been a really great reunion. Moses fills Aaron in. And they go back to Egypt. And perform the acts that God had told Moses to do. They did it for the leaders. Throwing the snake down. Uh, or the stick down and it became a snake. Um, you know, so they believe they say, wow, this must be God. And they're all in. Years before, 40 years earlier, Moses had offered himself as their deliverer, and they rejected him. But now the time is right, and the circumstances are right. And Moses is not doing it in his own power. He's mm -hmm. doing it the right way, through God. Um, also think about it. He left 40 years earlier. Anyone about 45 or older would have no idea who this guy was. He was 40 and old and younger. He wasn't even, they weren't even alive when he left. But about 45, they were still young kids. So here comes this guy out of the wilderness doing these signs. Um, now Aaron they knew because Aaron had been with them and so he probably added some credibility to Moses. Verse 31 when it talks about and the people believed and they worship right response. Great response. When, when we see evidence of God we should turn to worship just like them. Moses and Aaron are on a spiritual high. They come and do what God tells them to do, and they're, they're believed. Um, now they probably think, well, maybe God was a little off. Maybe this is going to be a piece of cake. You know, if they believe so easily, maybe Pharaoh will too. But God said it wouldn't be. And God never lies. So it's not going to be easy. Okay, chapter 5, um, Betty, verses 1 through 3. Okay. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three, day, three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Okay, th this has got to take a lot of courage to go before Pharaoh, the mightiest man in not just Egypt, but in the whole area. Um, and he is not a public servant. The public serve him. There's no constitution, no law, no legislature that's higher than him, or even remotely equal to him. He is all powerful, and they are going to him. Um, the pharaohs were said to be children of the sun god. And they were friends with the greatest gods of Egypt. And they sat with them in their own temples and they received worship. Um, and Pharaoh knew all this, or Moses knew all this, because he grew up in the courts. He knew what it was like. And he's still going. And he is bringing a demand from God, not a request. Let my people go. And this is where God's saying, these are my people. These are my children. They need to be free. Anyone that belongs to God, we're free. And it's, it's the same for the Hebrews. They are God's children. 
and he wants them free. Um, he says, let them go into the wilderness for three days and feast. First mention of feasts in the Bible. Won't be the last. We'll hear, see those a lot. In the next five chapters, we are going to hear, let my people go seven times. It's a warning to Pharaoh. Let them go or I'm going to declare war on you. He gives them plenty of time and warning, doesn't he? He does. This is a confrontation between the one true God and one that thinks he's God. Okay, I wonder who's going to win. <laughs> Pharaoh says, I have no idea who this God is. Um, and I know lots of gods. I don't know this one. And he's not asking for information on who is this God. He is expressing bold-faced arrogance. Basically, he's saying, what right does this new God have to come and call the Israelites my people? The Jews are my slaves. They don't belong to anybody else. They're mine. I'm not going to let them go because if I let them go, that would be like saying there's a God that's greater than me. That's not happening. Pharaoh knows who this God is now while he's sitting imprisoned in hell. So verse 1, let my people go, was a demand. Now it's a request. Let my people go on a short journey, three days. We talked about this last week. Three days didn't necessarily mean three days. It was more of a short journey. Um, but he gives a reason this time to go and worship God. Um, there's no way they would have made it to Mount Sinai in three days. So when he said a three-day journey doesn't mean three days in what we think it means. Um, regardless, God had told Moses that Pharaoh was going to reject this. And he does. Um, mm. Now, to do these feasts, they needed to be out of sight of the Egyptians because when God, when you sacrifice to God, you're sacrificing animals. And that would have been offensive to the Egyptians because they worshiped cows and um, all the other animals they would have sacrificed. They would have, they would have been flabbergasted. Um, Moses even appeals to Pharaoh's um, sense, saying, if you don't let us go sacrifice, God is going to um, kill us. And if he kills us, no more slaves. So you don't want that to happen, do you? But it doesn't move Pharaoh. God already knew, that, knew the response. No, I'm not doing it. Okay, verse 4 through 9. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you causing the people to neglect their work? Get to your labor. Pharaoh also said, look, the people of the land are so numerous, and you would stop them from their labor. That day, Pharaoh commanded the overseers of the people, as well as their foremen, don't continue to supply the, new, the people with straw for making bricks as before. They must go and gather straw for themselves, but require the same quota of bricks from them as they were making before. Do not reduce it. For they are slackers, and that is why they are crying out, let us go sacrifice to our God. Impose heavier work on the men, then they will be occupied with it and not pay attention to deceptive words. Okay, Pearl's had enough. He's irritated, don't want to hear any more. Um, little does he know that his choice is going to open the door to discouragement, distress, disease, destruction, death for him and his people. He could have made a different choice. 
there's um, there was a revival that swept through Princeton, New Jersey, <clears throat> and Aaron Burr came to the president of the university and he said, Mr. President, I have made up my mind to consider the claims of Christ. Now, Mr. President, what would you do? The old president of the university gave him this advice. He said, Burr, if I were you, I would wait until the excitement of the revival had subsided, and then I would think it out carefully. Hmm. Aaron Burr bowed his head for a moment, and then he said, Mr. President, that is exactly what I will do. And Aaron Burr never again expressed a desire to become a Christian. And that decision hmm. affected his whole life and affected others. Um, we need to we need to weigh our decisions carefully not not wait especially if we hear God talking to us so in the meantime the Hebrews are not getting the work done that Pharaoh wants done um, remember the previous Pharaoh had tried to limit the amount of people he tried to kill them off other things. This pharaoh doesn't seem to want to kill them off. He wants to use them. He, he likes the big numbers because you can get more work out of more people. Um, so he's, he's not after killing them. He wants more work. So instead of freeing them, he punishes them. He says, if you have time to waste to go out to the desert, you, you aren't using all your time working for me. You can do more work. And he doesn't waste time implementing it. He says, it says that same day. The Egyptian records show that absenteeism was a real problem among the slaves. And frequently the excuse that was used was that they were offering um, something to their gods. So they needed the day off. Pharaoh's not having any of that. Um, so, before, straw would be given to them. Now they have to go get their own. So, straw in bricks, in the clay bricks, it would make it stronger. There's apparently some kind of acid in it. And as the straw decays, that acid makes the bricks stronger. So, the clay by itself, the bricks would not be very strong at all. So they needed that, um, that straw. And so they chopped straw and put it in with the clay. Um, um, where did I? Okay, that's in the next set of verses. So when it's in verse eight where it says, let their work be heavier, let their labor be heavier, the idea is pour it on. Just pour on all the work. <clears throat> Pharaoh is wanting there to be a split between Moses and the people. He wants them not to listen to Moses. And he dares to call God's word false. And he will pay for that. But not yet. Are you okay with reading? Sure. Okay, yeah. verses 10 through 14. Okay. And the taskmaster masters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people saying thus says pharaoh i will not give you straw go get yourself straw where you can find it yet none of your work will be reduced so the people were scattered abroad throughout all of the land of egypt to gather stubble instead of straw and the taskmasters forced them to hurry saying fulfill your work your daily quota as when, you, as when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's task, task masters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? Okay, so the Hebrews are saying now, Moses has really gone and done it. He's made it worse for us. Um, and poor Moses, is he gonna is he gonna keep doing what God told him to do? It's gotta be so discouraging. I mean, the day before they were, he was excited and 
and now everything's just wrong. The goal was to free Israel, and the opposite has happened. They're, they're working harder than ever, and the leaders know exactly who to blame. Moses. So stubble or chaff, here's me say chaff, um, that's what's found in the field after you harvest the straw. It's the little pieces. And it is really hard to pick up. And it is mixed with all sorts of other things that are not straw. It's a poor substitute for straw. But it was, it was everywhere. It was easy to find. Um, it, it would have small twigs and stems and withered weeds, just all sorts of things. Usually they would use it for fuel. But now they're having to use it for brick making and it's not good for brick making. Not only did they have to gather it, they had to chop it up, they had to try to sort it if they could. It meant doing at least double work. Um, Josephus, a Jewish historian that lived about the time of Jesus, he said they would make the bricks during the day and gather the straw at night. Okay, so the foreman, um, verse 14, um, the foreman of the people of Israel, I, I forgot how what your version said, they were, they were Hebrew. The taskmasters were Egyptian, and the taskmaster masters assigned um, foremen, and these guys were good at record keeping. Um, you notice who it is that's beat. It's the foreman. The ones that were assigned by the by the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Poor things, they were cotton mill. Um, so. When they were beaten, it might be similar to how they're beaten today in the Middle East. Um, what happens is the culprit lies down on his belly and his legs are turned up behind him. And then he's given blows on the soles of his feet. And severe punishment. And the um, sufferer can't walk for lots for weeks and maybe they might be lame forever and that's a typical Middle Eastern punishment um, so the people go to the taskmasters and they say why is this happening to us why are you doing to this to us we didn't do anything um, and they don't get the answer they want from the taskmasters so verse 15 through 19 then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet, we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being big, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told, you're not to reduce, reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. Okay, so these foremen, the one that were, ones that were beaten, are the ones that are going to Pharaoh here. And who are they taking their troubles to? Not God. Pharaoh. They want to go back to the status quo. They weren't happy before, but now they'd be happy to get back where they were. Notice how often they use the phrase, your servants. Are they trying to convince Pharaoh that they're loyal to him? Um, and Pharaoh is absolutely unsympathetic. He's cruel. He believed the problem was that the Hebrews were just plain lazy. And notice he says it twice. And anytime anything is repeated in the Bible, that emphasizes it that much more. He thought they were absolutely lazy. And these guys are hardworking guys. Isn't Pharaoh kind of defeating his own purpose? Because 
they were working hard. Now they can't work as hard. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of defeating his own purpose. Yeah. Maybe maybe he feels there's just so many of them. You know, I, I don't know. And he's not playing fair. But he's fair. He doesn't have to play fair. Um, someone else doesn't play fair. That's Satan. He doesn't have to play fair until God makes him play fair. There is ancient documentation that shows that the Egyptians did have brick quotas. So the scripture goes right along with that. Um, so Pharaoh says, get back to working for me, not those that imaginary God. Um, the form is see more beatings in the future. They're in trouble. Verse 20 and 21 says, They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stink in the, uh, in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So, as you can imagine, Moses and Aaron aren't very popular. Um, and you notice they're there waiting for them. And boy, do those um, foremen let them have it. They pour out all their feelings. And they are sure God isn't happy with Moses and Aaron. But we, we, we know God already knew what was happening, that Moses and Aaron were doing exactly what God wanted. But they're thinking... If God was happy with them, this wouldn't be happening to us. Um, when Israel was obedient to Pharaoh, Israel thought, Pharaoh likes us. Now they see how he really feels about them. They, now that the idea of freedom's been raised, Pharaoh showing his true nature. These people stink to him. Ooh. They realize all he cares about is how much work we can get done for him. So we're getting a picture into just how fickle these people are. <laughs> and we're going to see a lot more of it. They're, kind of, they're wishy-washy on everything. Um, they're acting like a lot of people do when things don't work out well for them. They blame someone else. And of course, God could have freed the Israelites with it. He could have just snapped his finger and they would have been free and in the promised land, but that's not the way he works. He loves to use people. Um, he knew they needed to struggle to become his people. They needed a lot of stretching. So what do you think is happening to Moses' confidence right now? <clears throat> He's probably in the dirt. Where are those sheep? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I like that, yeah. <laughs> Give me back those sheep. <laughs> okay, verse 22, 23. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Okay, so the people let Moses ha have it. Moses is letting God have it. Um, we had a friend who just believed you should only ever talk to God in worshipful and adoring ways and never talk to him about how you're really feeling about things because that is doesn't honor God. <laughs> hmm. No, he already knows how we feel. One time um, when David first became disabled and um, we had three young kids, I had never worked in my life. So we were in a really hard spot. And we didn't have a car for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, 
David got tired of it one night, and he went out and he yelled at God. <laughs> and he said, you promised to take care of us, and here we are having to walk. We live three miles from church, and we, we would, sometimes people would give us a ride, but other, lots of times we'd go walking that with three little kids, and he'd had enough of that. Next morning, his brother came and said, I just got this car from an impound lot because he worked for the city. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. <laughs> but God knows our feelings. Um, he can take it when we get upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe sometimes he might be waiting for us to express our feelings. You just never know. So Moses has some good questions. Why is this happening, God? Um, but he already forgot what God told him at the burning bush that Pharaoh was not going to let them go easily. Um, Moses' old fears come crashing in. Am I the right person? Are you sure you chose the right person? Pharaoh and Egypt, they're just too strong. I can't do this. And he's right. He can't. But God can. Um, any shred of confidence in his own abilities, just gone. And that's probably what God wanted. He wanted Moses to trust God. But Moses is thinking, I never wanted this stupid job anyway. <laughs> Give me the sheep. <laughs> yeah. They don't listen either, but at least, yeah. Okay, we're in chapter 6. It's got to be a while. Um, verse 1. Just verse 1. Uh -huh. uh, but the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Okay, notice uh, God doesn't answer Moses' questions. He asks the wrong question again. He never, say, he never says why. But he does say, give a better answer. Don't worry, I'm taking care of it. I'm in control. Um, while Moses is feeling discouraged by what he thought was God's lack of action, um, God says... I am in control. And he says, now you will see. Um, no more delay. It's happening now. Moses was discouraged because he was impressed by the wrong person. He had the almighty God behind him. And here was this man. And he's afraid of the man. He tells Moses that not only will Pharaoh let them go, he's going to drive them out. He's going to want them gone out of his sight. Moses, God's trying to get Moses focused off of Pharaoh and onto him. Off the Hebrews who didn't trust him. Off his problems. And on the right thing. Yeah. Verses 2 through 5. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Okay. God reminds Moses of his great name. He is the same God that appeared to his ancestors, to the patriarchs, and gave them the covenant. But they saw the covenant being made. They didn't see the covenant being fulfilled. Moses is getting to see the covenant fulfilled. So he's getting to see God's name in a greater way. Um, the patriarchs knew God as the creator of the covenant. God is going to, or Moses is going to see him as the fulfiller of the covenant. 
um, the patriarchs knew God, but not in the same intimate way that Moses will. They knew the power of God, but they didn't see the same kind of personal relationship that Moses is going to have. Um, God also wants us to see him in that personal relationship. Um, as the one who keeps his promises. And if we look at our lives, we can probably see so many times God has kept our promises to us. And that's the relationship he wants to have with us. Let's have to continue. Okay, verse 6 through 8. Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. Uh, through eight. I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. Notice how many I am's in there. Who's doing all the work here? God. Yeah, God, God, God's doing it all. It's not us. He's already told Moses who he is. Now he's saying, I want you to say this to the Hebrews. And each I am is a promise that God makes. What's interesting is that each I am statement is in the past tense. That shows how confident God is that everything is happening. It's not, this may happen, this will happen, this is happening. The first two I wills, Moses is to tell Israel what God ultimately promised. Not only to deliver them from bondage, but to give them the land promised to them. Um... Verses 7 and 8, their promises to the Hebrews. Um, and then he closes it with an I am that reminds them that he is the covenant maker and, um, and his powerful name again. And he, he is the same I am God now. He still has promises for us. Verse 9. Betty, that would be you. Verse 9. So Moses spoke this to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. Okay. The Israelites have been there, done that. They don't want to trust this guy again. They've been hurt. The last time they trusted him, things got worse. It's... <laughs> may not be that they don't trust God, but they don't trust this guy. Um, their years of slavery have made them think like slaves instead of people of the covenant. Pharaoh was bigger in their eyes than God was. It talks about them being despondent, being discouraged. Um, the word that's used for it is that they're in such a deep anguish they can't even breathe. Sometimes we can find ourselves in that kind of anguish and find it hard to trust God because we're going through such a tough time and hard to believe that he cares for us. But he does, and he brings us through whatever it is. Um, Ezekiel 20, verses Five through nine show why God was so small and Pharaoh so big in their hearts. Um, Ezekiel explained that they trusted the gods of their oppressors, worshiping the gods of the Egyptians. They were worshiping the wrong thing. Verses 10 through 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go from his land. But Moses said in the presence, Lord's presence, If the Israelites will not listen to me, 
then how will Pharaoh listen to me, since I am such a poor speaker? Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them commands concerning both the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Okay, second confrontation. Let my people go. Not a request, a command. Notice no mention of three-day journey. That part's over. It's just plain let my people go. So Moses comes back with one of his old excuses. I don't speak well enough. I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I tried. I failed. Problem is, it's a lot of I. He needs to let God take care of it. He's, if his own people won't listen to him, why, why would Pharaoh? But they need to listen to God. Um, God want, wanted Moses to be persistent, not to look at Pharaoh, not to look at the children of Israel, not even to look at himself, but look to God and God alone. Moses, first setback, he wants to quit. And we may not think so that he's such a great guy, but how many times do we get face a setback and just want to give up? And he, he's got a hard job ahead of him. But God has a lot of work to do in Moses' heart before he's going to be able to get him through all this. Hmm. He's building endurance in Moses, and Moses is going to need that for 40 years, dealing with his people. He had to understand this was God's will, not, not just a suggestion for Pharaoh. God wants his people set free. This is his command, and it will happen one way or another. Okay, verses 14 through 19, and this is a bunch of names. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they sure are. Mm -hmm. I will butcher most of them. That's fine. <laughs> uh, what, what I've told the class is you just say them really fast, and everyone thinks you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, these are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanak, um, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. And the sons of Simeon were uh, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, uh, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Jershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Jershon were Libni and Shimi, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, uh, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. These are the, the families of Levi, according to their generations. Yeah, I think you deserve it. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Very good. That's probably how I would have said them all. <laughs> um, okay, so we get thrown a genealogy in the middle of this story. Why? Um, because it's a way of introducing Aaron and Moses. and um, But especially Aaron. It sets the stage for some things that are going to happen in the lives of these men and women. And um, you notice how far this genealogy goes. Um, how many sons, how many tribes do we have? It's 12. 12. Um, we get Reuben, we get Simeon, we get Levi. It stops. The purpose of this is to focus on the children of Levi. But they mention the older ones first because it's a genealogy. Mm -hmm. So we don't get the rest of the genealogies here. Thank goodness. Or we've been reading <laughs> names for days. We'll get those later. Um, 
In the tribe of Levi, there's three main families, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And each of these families, they're, the Levites are going to become the priests, and each of these families are going to give, get specific duties as priests. Um, we see the names Merari, Asir, and Phinehas. Those are all Egyptian names. So they didn't all keep Hebrew names. For three of the descendants were given the length of their life. When you were given the length of a life, it means they had a blessed life. A long and blessed life. Let me see. Mm. Um, hmm. You know, I'm kind of finished this section. So Genesis, if you will read from 20 to the end of it. Twenty-five, or the end of the chapter. End of the chapter. Okay. Amram married his father's sister Jochebed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived one hundred and thirty-seven years. The sons of Izar, Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, daughter of Amminadab and sister of Nashon. And she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Esser, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These were the Korahite clans. Mm -hmm. Eleazar, son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. It was this same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Can I go ahead and finish? Yeah. yeah okay, sorry. Now sorry. when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Okay, so Amram took as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister. What is your father's sister? Your aunt. Your aunt. He married his aunt. Later, when Moses is given the law, no more marrying aunts. That is interesting. Amram and Jochebed are his parents. So saying your parents should yeah. don't do that kind of thing anymore um, it not only tells us the ancestors of Moses and Aaron but some of Aaron's descendants we see his sons his grandson through Eleazar um, it's important because this priesthood is eventually coming to the family of Aaron and it's going to be passed down to his descendants and so it was a important to know who his descendants were. Um, Korah was Moses and Aaron's uncle, and we'll see him more of him in number 16. Notice in verses 20 and 26, Aaron's listed before Moses because he was older. Verse 27, we get the reverse, because Moses is the leader. So, told to go back to Pharaoh, um, it picks up right where it was before the genealogy. Moses saying, I'm not worthy, I have, I can't speak. Um, it's never going to work. Pharaoh's never going to listen. And God says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm in control. You're going to go do it. Um, Moses has a performance-based approach to his ministry. He's assumed it's up to him to get results. If people listened to him, he was doing his job. If they didn't, he was failing his job. Um, but it's God's job to prepare their hearts. It's the same way for us today. We're told to tell people about Jesus. If they don't listen, it's not us. We're still told to go. Um, no matter how 
eloquent or persuasive we are, it takes faith for someone to believe. And faith is a gift from God. Um, the prophet is not responsible for the way people respond to his message. The prophet is responsible for giving the message. And that's the message God wants for Moses and for us. And that is the end of chapter 6. We don't always end at the end of a chapter. <laughs> but, okay, I'm going to... Bye, Millie.